Welcome to Lucky Episode 13 of the Stage Worthy Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Rickaby. On Stage Worthy, I interview people who make theater, from actors to directors to playwrights and more, and talk to them about everything from why they chose the theater to their work process and anything in between. I'm really excited to tell you that I'm going to be performing my own play, The Commandment, my first uh, one-person play at the Hamilton Fringe Festival this summer. So I'll be starting rehearsals for that really soon. And uh, if you happen to be in the Hamilton area or the Toronto area or anything, any place near there, I hope you'll come out and check me out. My guest on this lucky 13th episode is Michael Ripley, a writer, performer from Toronto. He's been seen and heard on the stage and on the microphone from New Brunswick to Alberta, and his writing has been seen around the world. You can find Stageworthy on Facebook and Twitter at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website at StageworthyPodcast.com. If you like what you hear, I hope you'll subscribe on iTunes or whatever podcast app you use, and consider leaving a comment or rating. You've been well. You've been busy. Yeah, uh, kind of ridiculous, ridiculously busy with my with my Joe job and with uh, some preparation for a TV series I'm I'm developing. Nice. Um, so uh, a lot of late nights, but better to better to be busy than than not busy at all, I guess. Oh, that's true. You just came back from a, a writing retreat, didn't you? Yeah, I was up. Uh, I was up at Lake of Bays. Which is you know near Huntsville there, and the uh, <laughs> we were up there for the weekend where it got you know the really cold weekend like the yeah, yeah. weekend of the winter it got down to minus forty one. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect for writing. Well, like I prospect. mean, if you're if you're considering that that you know you're gonna going to get away to uh, to. To, to concentrate on writing and you won't be distracted by going outside for a nice long walk no uh, no that's true you know why, why uh why worry you know like my my feeling was that if i if i went outside i would die <laughs> so it was better to stay inside and write yeah <laughs> absolutely did you get did you did you find it a successful weekend it was good uh the 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 group was well, the group was all uh, part of the uh, the Monday night, uh, the collection of Monday nighters that uh, I may have mentioned to you before. Mm-hmm. Chris Owens' group there. And I have a writing circle that I've uh, developed with about 20 of the people that are regulars. And yeah, so we had about 10 people up there and mm-hmm. everyone helped pay for gas and... Um, we brought food and wrote each evening. We had a community meal and there was a, you know, like a 90 minute share session optional. And uh, yeah, it was, it was great. I got to work on a play that I've been kind of back burning for about five years. So yeah, it, it was good. Nice. 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 Um, um, when, when did you start, start writing? writing? Right. Like, I know you as an actor, um and what was it that you started uh, or have you always written as well well i was actually um actually fiddled around with the idea of becoming a poet back uh after i got out of theater school uh i've always i've always written poetry and uh it's not something you uh generally talk about <laughs> with this is true this is people, true you know but i'm i'm a published poet and it's uh yeah, I've always I've always loved poetry. I'm a big fan of um well, when I was in grade 10, my math teacher Mr. Watt um recognized that uh, I had kind of a poet's sort of inclination and he introduced me to uh he introduced me to Sylvia Plath and he introduced me to uh Lawrence Ferlinghetti and he introduced me to Charles Bukowski and he gave me this amazing education. He would just hand me books and I'd go away and devour them. (laughs) So, uh, yeah. And, uh, 
I fancied myself a bit of a poet and you know tried to make a go of it but in the end uh, I needed something longer form mm. and uh, I wrote a, I wrote a play called uh, geometric tongue that was workshopped by Linda Hill at theater direct and that was in 1990. Four, I think that was my first play, mm. and I've been writing ever since. It's the perfect way to uh, to keep alive creative, creatively, you know, to empower yourself in that way that uh, most actors, uh, you know, actors don't get that feeling. That, you know, you're constantly waiting for the phone to ring, and if you can somehow find a way to uh, gain some control. Uh, then, then it's going to be easier, you know, between gigs. Yeah. Did you did you did you write in in Calgary as well, or was that like you've always been a poet, or you were interested in poetry? Yeah. At what age did you turn your attention to writing poetry? When or why? Well, uh, let's go with both. Like. Okay. <laughs> well, um. So, yeah, like I said, uh, back when I was in high school, I was turned on to poetry by, um, I was in love. There was a girl <laughs> named Dana Patrick who I was crazy in love with. I, I wrote her a poem a day, about five poems a week for about eight months. <laughs> wow. I was obsessed and she liked me being that way and would take the poems and read them and you know tell me how much she liked them so uh you know nothing motivates a, a you know a, a, a teenage boy better than praise from a girl that he no, would love to make out with so uh <laughs> yeah i uh i don't have those poems anymore uh at, at the end of that sort of eight month period, I, I finally got around to writing the a sort of magnum opus, one in which uh, I asked her to uh, to go steady with me, and she knew that that was the kind of topic I kind of laid laid the foundation, you know, to to let her know that uh, it maybe was coming, and she wouldn't let me read it. <laughs> She, she said, I can't let you read it. And I was like, why Why not? She said, because I'll say yes. And I'm like, what is wrong with that? What? <laughs> and she said, I can't. And I said, I hate you. And I ran away. She chased me down the hallway. And I, and I ducked into the boys' locker room so she couldn't follow me. And uh, broke my hand on, on, the, on the open door of a locker. And uh, went went back to my locker, like, you know, at my end of the school, near my homeroom or whatever. And uh, waiting there was uh, Frankie, Dana's best friend, um, who I found out at a high school reunion uh, 10 years later, uh, was actually in love with me. And I was completely blind. Oh. She <laughs> was great. If I could go back, if I had that time machine and I could go back, of course. I would... I would absolutely go out with Frankie, but uh, anyway, I was in love. So uh, yeah, but uh, Mr. Watts saw me writing, and because of because of that, he turned me on to uh, to other poets, and that that inspired me. Mm -hmm. And theater was that always something that you were interested in? Yeah, well. You know, before grade six, I wanted to be a baseball player or a cartoonist or an airplane airplane pilot. But in uh, in Alberta, uh, when you hit grade seven, you are allowed to take options. And uh, I took drama, and it was it was a lot of fun. You know, I was this I was this like a lot of people in my generation. I was kind of a, addicted to television. You know. I watched the Six Million Dollar Man, and mm -hmm. I pretended to be Robin Williams from Mork and Mindy to my parents' dismay. You know, I said Shaw's butt instead of darn. Of course. Um, you know, tried to hang upside down in my closet 
to sleep at bedtime, stuff like that. And, um, and I've always enjoyed stories. You know, I, I was always a voracious reader. Um, and I, I was a liar. I would tell, I would tell lies just to see if I could get away with it. You know, I would, I would, I would, for no reason, like I, I would go, I would, you know, uh, tell my mom I was going to my one friend's house and then I would call my friend and I would say, if my mom calls, tell her that I am in the bathroom and then call me. And, you know, I would, I would create these elaborate scenarios because I th this idea of pretending, uh, it really turned me on. I really, I, I liked it. it, drove my parents crazy, but, um, and I was always pretending, you know, me and my sisters, uh, we would do these choreographed kind of little pantomime plays to the music, uh, of my mom's massive 45 collection. Um, and I read, like you said, I, I, I read a lot, um, like I, re I remember reading Call of the Wild in grade four. I read Les Mis when I was in grade six. Um, and I read a lot of comics. My aunt, uh, my aunt Lorraine, every time we visited her, which was often because uh, we had cousins about the same age, she had a comic. She had a, she had a drawer, this wide, wide drawer in this old dresser that was full of Tales from the Crypt and mm -hmm. Sergeant Rock. And, and uh, she just send me into that room and I would sit there with these stacks of, of old comics and read them. So, so I, I, I sort of had the groundwork for, for, uh, you know, I had, the, there was this kind of uh, potential inside of me. Uh, I, I wanted to tell stories. I didn't really, I didn't realize it until, uh, until grade seven. And then, yeah, I took drama and then we moved and I went to a new school and suddenly I, I didn't know anyone. And this speech impediment, which was a non-issue for most of my life, suddenly became a big issue. And uh, if it wasn't for the confidence that I found in drama class, because here was something where how I sounded didn't really mind the matter. And I was, I was confident in it. So I, um, I had a good time and I, I, I think I found my identity mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, like I won drama awards and stuff like that. And, um, I, I had a grand total of two friends <laughs> in grade eight and nine, Daryl Crisco. Uh, he was a Ukrainian dancer. And uh, Jason Offner, who was a jock, who was my friend outside of school, but pretended not to know me when we were in school. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. <laughs> I, yeah, I had the speech impediment. Um, I, I, I said everything like this. I sounded like this all the time. Okay. I had a horrible lisp. The first day of class in grade eight, David Manning was kind of the bully of the school. I doubt David Manning will be listening to this, but if you are David, <laughs> ha ha, <laughs> I am over you now completely, obviously. Anyway, David cut in front of me at the water fountain and he did one of these, hey, thanks for saving my spot there, guy. <laughs> yeah. And I realized that, you know, these are the defining moments, right? I I, I must say something. So I, uh, I stood up for myself and I, I said, what do you think you're doing? Zipperhead, and there was a show called uh, Square Pegs. I don't know if you know the show. I know the show. Great show. Doesn't really stand up now. I've seen. I, I've I've seen snippets, but so a few of them do. Yeah, but it was great then. And uh, there was this one character named Slash who uh, called people zipperheads. So I was, you know, always quoting him. And uh, anyway. It didn't come out as Zipperhead. It came out as Zipperhead. And David Manning looked at me and said, What did you just call me? Hey, everybody, Zipperhead just called me Zipperhead. 
And that was my nickname for two years. Uh, Everyone called me that. So I didn't talk, except in drama class. I didn't talk at all because I was so ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> how long? How long did it take you to uh, to overcome the 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 lisp? Well, between grade nine and ten, so between junior and senior high, in that summer, I got rid of it. I practiced in front of the mirror for about an hour a day. I got rid of it. The trouble was when I got to high school, I didn't actually know how to talk to anyone. And uh, again, um, it was drama that gave me a place where I where I could fit in. Do you remember what the first the first play you did was? Yeah, uh, the ledge, the ledger, and the legend. It's a two hander, one act about a guy who's. Uh, committing suicide and the insurance salesman who tries to get him to sign a contract before he leaps. <laughs> <laughs> and I did that with my Ukrainian dancer friend, Daryl Crisco at a, like a parent teacher evening open house sort of thing in grade, uh, grade eight. Hmm. And, but the first, the, yeah, and then I did a number of uh, plays in high school. We did enemy of the people once we did some musicals, uh, I had a great teacher, Mrs. Uh, Hashman. She tried to introduce us to uh, different theater forms. So she introduced us to Commedia dell'arte and even, um, even Japanese play forms. Um, like, uh, do you know, there's a, there's a, there's a haiku. Um, I may be wrong. He may not be a haiku poet, but there's a famous Japanese poet named Isa. And uh, someone in America wrote a play that had Isa as the central character. And she cast me as Isa. Uh, that would not happen today. It'd be like, you know, gods of Egypt, right? Mm. There's some, a bit of whitewashing going on there. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so we learned, we learned some kabuki theater forms. We learned gesture and mask work. You know, this was in grade, grade 11. Uh, it was pretty That's extraordinary. That's pretty good for grade 11. Yeah, yeah. And same with uh, the Commedia dell'arte. We, we, did, we did a play called Gap in Generations, which had all of these stock uh, Commedia characters. There was no improvisation. Yeah, none of the, uh, the typical Commedia uh, tropes, but... Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the the characters were all there, you know, the Capitanos and the, you know, uh, Pantalones and the Totalias and the Arlequinos. They were all there. So, uh, yeah. And then when I went to, uh, when I went to university, my, uh, my goal was to uh, get into a fine arts program. Did you know at that time that, that uh, you wanted to make a career in theater? Yeah. Yeah, I really didn't have a choice in the matter. I, I, I didn't I'm not all that good at anything else. Um, and I, I, you know, part of it is you know I'm adopted, and my entire life I've sort of honed this. Uh, I don't know. I've kind of honed this ability to listen and understand people and then adjust how I act around them so that, so that we can get along. And, um, I, be, I've, I became really good at it. Uh, we moved a lot and before, you know, before grade seven and I completely climbed up, I became quite adept at, um, meeting new people and, um, just learning that thing that all actors need to learn uh, to listen. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think being adopted and not really feeling like you belong uh, has a, you know, is a large part of why I, uh, I'm an actor today. Like uh, I think I'm always, I don't know. I'm, I'm so used to trying on different skins.
And for me, writing is the same thing. Um, once, once you get an idea and you have a sense of these characters, it's like an improvisation. They start to talk to each other. And I'm sure as a writer, you know this feeling. Yeah. Uh, there's that exciting point in your writing, whether it's a scene or it's a full length, where the, the play takes on a life of its own. And uh, I find that incredibly satisfying. And it feeds into that kind of core, um, I don't know, a trait of mine that I've uh, that I've carried with me my entire life. I love that moment when, you know, it doesn't always happen, but when you find yourself uh, as a writer, you feel like you're not actually doing anything <laughs> yeah. because yeah. the characters are strong enough that they're talking to each other and you're just transcribing it's the best and and it's 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 amazing how you can be surprised it's amazing how they can surprise you yeah and I, I, this this is not something new people have obviously been talking about how this occurs and you know that th this is the nature of the beast and as as writers the characters they take a life of their own that doesn't take away from the fact that it is just cool. It is just great. Yeah. And it's just so exciting to be there, like uh, to be inside that. And uh, it's exhilarating. And so where, did you go to, where did you go to university? Uh, well, I, I tried to get into the university of Alberta. Um, I made it into uh, like, to get into the U of A into the fine arts program, you have to take one year and then you audition. I think you're, well, most university programs are like this. You take, you take a foundation year and you audition to get into the program. And I only wanted to go to the U of A. I was convinced that that, that is, I was convinced that, I was convinced that that was where I needed to be. And I didn't get in, I just wasn't ready. So I continued on doing uh, an honors drama degree, uh, focusing on um, dramaturgy and uh, play analysis. And I was quite good at it. Um, Alex Hawkins was the, the head of the department. Alex Hawkins, if you know anything about theater history, is, is a, a, a pretty big name. He worked under Oscar G. Brockett, whose text, his tome, is kind of the cornerstone of most theater history uh, courses if you if you ever take one uh anyway he was this uh, inspiring guy who taught who taught theater history in a way that really brought it alive for me for example in my sec in in my second year uh working with him we did we explored brechtian theater by and it was a large class there was about 80 people in this class he had three assistants we took Brecht's life of galileo split it into parts and there was groups of uh, six and we all did a segment of the play and in the doing it we explored uh brecht approaches you know uh, uh to theater so we we uh, you know we not we not only learned about the alienation effect, we practiced it. We, you know, uh, some people did, did their scenes um, uh, with puppets. You know, Brecht was very concerned with uh, people not getting too emotionally involved in the moment so that they forgot the message that he was trying to sh you know, share through his theater. And uh, this alienation effect, this, you know, reminding people of the fact that they were watching a play is a big part of um, what he was trying to do. Not always very successfully, but uh, yeah. So uh, working with someone like Alex Hawkins really informed me. And uh, if I hadn't, if I hadn't made it into the, into an acting program um, that, that following year, I, I think I would still be uh, exploring that. I think it'd still be in that field in some capacity. I've actually taught, I'm a bit of an autodidact. I, I taught theater history at Ryerson for, uh, for two years. 
and um, I'm um, I'm a I'm a bit of a, a student of, uh, of of theater history. Peter Wilde, whom you know at George Brown, uh, was uh, always rolling his eyes at me. You know, he'd ask he'd ask a question in theater history, and I'd put my hand up, and he'd say, "Not you." Michael, we've heard just enough about you. Yeah. So, did, did you ever get into the U of A? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, the, so, yeah, I didn't make that first year. I auditioned at U of A. Um, I auditioned for U of A for um, George Brown and for York and was accepted to all. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was so taken with uh, the George Brown program, uh, as you know, through my research and through the conversations that I had with uh, Heiner Pillar and Peter Wild, uh, that I decided to go there. I liked the conservatory approach. I wasn't interested in, you know, dividing my time between geometry labs and uh, and theater. Yeah, that was the thing that. Uh attracted me because i was accepted into ryerson and george brown oh yeah yeah. and i was looking at the courses you know i looked at at what was what my 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 the year would be like at at ryerson right and the thought of like going from concentrating on theater to writing an essay on somebody on you know a philosophy class just didn't didn't appeal to me so i i wanted to the conservatory appealed to me too i i get it and you know like i I understand the value of it um but i took two years of university and i had full course i had i had a full course load i was i was taking english I, i took classics um i took mythology courses all of that um, I took French, all of it inspired uh, and informed me as a, as a theater artist to go to a university program and have to do that all over again. It just, mm. it, it would have been a waste of my time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I was, uh, I, I was excited by the sort of vocational approach that, that uh, a college program offered. So you, you picked up and uh, off you went. Uh, from Alberta to Ontario. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Was that was that uh, was getting from Alberta from Calgary uh, into Toronto? Was that was there any kind of culture shock involved there? Or was it uh... well at the time I was living in Edmonton because I was going to the U of A there, and um, uh, my girlfriend at the time she got accepted into the MFA acting program at York. Um, and I made it into the U of A, but I was, there was, there were political things happening at that program, um, during that period of time, um, that soured me to, uh, to going there. Anyway, I wanted to be with my girlfriend. So it sort of all, it all lined up and the idea of a, of a clean start, really appealed so yeah i uh it was a it was a pretty easy decision to come out here and you know we we were essentially from small from a small town you know when you when you come to toronto as someone who grew up in 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 edmonton um it's a shock like i the the uh the experience of driving the 1981 Pontiac Grand Torino with the U-Haul on the back on the 401, you know, it's six lanes wide and everyone's going 40 mile, 40 kilometers over the speed limit. It was harrowing. It was white knuckle and it was uh, terrifying. I, I stayed with a family friend for the first few nights at, at his place up in, um, up in Brampton. And uh, yeah, so we were on the we were on the on the freeway, and it it uh, it was exciting, but it was yeah, it was it was a shock. And then uh, coming to school, 
uh, it was all right, you know. In the end, in the end, I adjusted, and because I was doing what I loved, it uh, it was all good. It was all good. Yeah. And at the end of the at the end of the three years, uh, you stayed in Ontario. Yeah. Well, you know, I got an agent. I had an agent agent before I left theater school, and uh, I worked pretty steady um, for a good four or five years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, uh, I had the fortune of being in some well-received plays. I, I did a play by uh, Ted Atherton, whom you may know. Uh, he's known primarily as an actor, but he's also a very fine writer. And he wrote a play called uh, Shareware that was a hit at uh, the Fringe. I think that was in 90 four mm -hmm. um and we got a best of the f best of the fringe right up and um and right after that i did a show at equity showcase directed by roger barton called scenes from an from an execution which is a howard barker play and to this day that is that's probably the 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 greatest role uh, the greatest uh, experience theatrically that i've that i've ever had I, I essentially had, well, I had the best part in the play. I was the bad guy. And the reviews were uh, over the moon. And I'm still stopped by people who saw that show. It was, uh, it, it was great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, I banged away at, uh, at being a working actor for a number of years. And then uh, I got a little bit tired of the, of not making a lot of money and got a job, <laughs> got a Joe job that paid really well and kind of dropped out of the business really. For all intents I, was and purposes. Actually, I ran into somebody uh, about a month, month ago who uh, was, who had basically left the business um, and, and got, got a job in government. government. And their whole thing was more about how, they felt like they weren't actually living their life because they were spending all of their time researching who's the artistic director of this, who's directing that, mm -hmm. um, who can I contact about this and hu the uh, hustling people. And they realized that, that all of the enjoyment of the business had, had been sucked out of uh, their life by all of that work. Yeah, there's no denying it. Like it is, it is hard work. Yeah, you know, you, you know, we're you're warned about it in theater school if you're lucky enough to have, you know, business of acting yeah. or um, or working actors who are your instructors. But until you live it, you really don't realize uh, how much work it does take and how mm -hmm. thick your skin has to be. I, you know, I don't think there's another profession where you're where you're so consistently forced to look yourself in the mirror and I don't know, convince, <laughs> convince yourself that it's all right. You know, yeah. you're constantly having to tell yourself, uh, you, well, just, uh, sort of, just realign and, uh, build yeah. and yeah, maintain confidence. Um, I, I never really lost confidence in, in myself as a performer, but I definitely, I, definitely was tired of living hand to mouth and when i got this when i got the job um it was working for this event uh um logistics company i'm a graphic designer and and i was basically their head of creative i felt like i was doing something that had a that that had an element that fed my artistic heart and um I gave myself a little bit of time to uh, to kind of pay off my student loan and and uh, yeah. After a while, uh, I realized that that wasn't the answer that I was that I was that I needed more, and uh, I got back into the business. But uh, yeah, how some long, of my how long were you out of the business. Well, you know what? I never left my agent. Mm -hmm. But my agent didn't give me auditions. I just wasn't available, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It was about six years, a good six years where I was kind of on hold. 
but uh, you know, I did a, I did I did a few things here and there, and and uh, and I wrote. So my writing, my writing was one way for me to uh, keep my foot in the door, even when I wasn't acting. And since then, now that I'm, I'm acting again, and and um, um, things are uh, sort of on the upswing for me that way once more. I'm, I've I've got these two. I've got something in each hand now, which um, I really didn't have in in my life before I took that hiatus. It, it was it was really only about acting. I didn't uh, I didn't take my writing all that seriously. It's, uh, it's, it's sometimes interesting to look at uh, how, how getting, getting a doing things outside of that business can actually feed the uh, the 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 career you know, expanding beyond the the concentrating on the um, auditioning and, and 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 that being your focus to uh you know working a job paying the bills and all. and that can actually when you come back to it you're sort of a bit a bit more grounded maybe than if you hadn't yeah i think oh, it's 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 like anything uh you really don't get an appreciation for something you've lost until you lose it and yeah of course i matured as well and i think i'm a, a far more nuanced performer than than i ever was and um the yeah the experience of being outside the business for all intents and purposes uh, absolutely has made me a better actor mm. i lived even though it was yeah. work a day and it was nine to five and and uh, it was full of stress i uh I, I I lived. I worked. I you know I you know I was in a there was a lot of drama in my life, even if it wasn't <laughs> theatrical drama, and it informs my writing. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Did uh, can we talk about about the series that you're working on? Can you tell us anything about that? Oh sure. Um, right. Well, it's. As as you know, I've I've done a number of theater projects, and uh, I'm I'm a fairly busy writer uh, for for the stage. But uh, I challenged myself to write something that that I would love to see on television. You know, there's so much happening. It really is. I know it's cliche to say it now, but it's kind of a golden age for television. The best stories uh, are there. I. I'd argue that uh, what's happening on on Netflix and HBO and AMC is a you know they're telling far more mature, interesting stories than than Hollywood is. Um. Anyway, I've uh, I, I I I wanted to, I, I wanted to challenge myself and and uh, write something for the for the small screen, and um, I came up with this this uh this character named uh Tyler Lately um who is a uh fire scene investigator slash um um underground gambler who is a closet firebug and um the show is called Fireproof and it's a procedural drama with kind of a long form narrative uh, narrative under underpinning it it's uh it's great uh we have three meetings coming up with networks actually uh two meetings in early march and then one mid march um there's a company in town called flout media uh and Shasta Justin is my producer she's a huge fan of uh, of my writing and uh she loves the pilot and uh what I've been doing for um what I've created as 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 a treatment so we're very confident that it's going to get uh, it's going to get <laughs> we're going to get some traction it really is nice. uh a nice piece so 
uh, that has that has me really stressed, but very excited <laughs> right now. <laughs> if you compare the process of writing for television or writing for the stage, did you? What do you find? What did you find was the the main difference between the two, aside from being able to change scenes and shorter scenes and things like that? Well, when I made when I made the short film adaptation of my 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 piece Nine Types of Ice, um, I learned very quickly that what you can say visually is far more effective on film than than uh, than what you can convey through uh, through words. It's uh, it's just more. You know the medium demands it, and um, that isn't to say that that you can't create a piece for television or for film that uh, doesn't have characters who uh, are talkative. You know, there's always going to be people who want to see din my dinner with Andre, and uh, uh, if anyone is a fan of Mad Men, you know that that is a slow piece. You know that is molasses, glacial molasses, slow in a lot of ways. Um, but, uh, even, even with something like, like Mad Men, uh, there is, it's so visually driven that as a, as a, as a theater writer, you need to, uh, you need to find ways to, you know, you need to constantly remind yourself that if there is a way to do it visually, then do it. And if you have something to say uh, that can't be captured visually, fine. But if it can, uh, don't even think twice. Just, just, just do it. You know, uh, film that sucker and uh, throw the dialogue in the bin. And you know that moves your action forward, and it uh, it's actually. Um, a wonderful sort of freeing experience as a writer to, to uh, kind of let that be, you know, you're still conceiving of the moments. Um, and if you, if you're directing it yourself, or if you're consulting with the director, you know, you, you, uh, you have a say in, in how those moments will manifest. Right. But uh, yeah. it's very, uh, it's, yeah, it's very different. It's a very different process. You mentioned nine types of ice, and that uh, was a, that's a short play, and it's been seen all over before it was even a film, isn't that right? You, yeah, yeah. In uh, Australia and uh, Dubai, and yeah. Did did you send like? Did you submit it to those those places, or did it like? How did you? Yeah. Well, my process for the for the for the past three years I've been writing a lot of short material, a lot of it coming out of writing challenges and sort of writing exercises and, and, you know, just sometimes uh, random ideas, but uh, I've been trying a lot of them out at uh, this, uh, this workshop that I go to on Mondays. Anyway, out of that, out of this workshop came um, the kernel of what is nine types of ice and I uh, hammered away at it after it did really well in that kind of workshop environment. And uh, I submitted it to a play festival series in Australia called Short and Sweet. Uh, they get about 2,000 plays from all over the world. They hammer down that list by half. And then they hammer it down again. So they create a long list of about a thousand and they create a short list of about 500. And then from that 500, um, the directors and the artistic directors of the various incarnations of the short and sweet festival, which is all across the South Pacific up into Asia and uh, now into the UK and the United States, the directors uh, choose from a micro list of the short list of about, I think there's about 200, 200 plays that uh, end up 
being part of the pool that they can draw from. And nine types made that uh, made that micro shortlist and was mounted first in Auckland and then in Melbourne and then in Sydney, then in Dubai, then in Chennai, India and Delhi, India. And um, in uh, Dubai, if I didn't say that, uh, yes, Dubai. And then, and then very recently in, um, in Bals, France, in a, in a short play festival that has nothing to do with um, short and sweet, um, but someone saw a production of it um, in Dubai and uh, uh, this short play festival in Bals, which is just outside of Toulouse, um, they, they, they asked for permission to do it there. Mm-hmm. So the success of it as a as a as a short play, and um, you know it it was an audience uh, it was an audience choice winner. It it made it made a few gala finals. Um, it uh, a producer approached me with uh, with some money and and said, "Why don't we make a short play short film of this?" So. Uh, I said, oh, yes, okay, sure, <laughs> <laughs> and it did great. It made it. Uh, it made it. It was an official selection of the Montreal World Film Fest, and uh, um, it's something that I that keeps cropping up. It's it's a it's a piece that uh, uh, I don't know. I feel like it. Uh, I feel like it's going to have more iterations uh, before I, you know, before I put it in the drawer. Do you, do you still revise it? Uh, actually I did actually, I, I revised it uh, about a month ago. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a short play festival here in town. It's never actually been mounted in Toronto. So there was a short play festival that's connected to uh, the social capital theater um, I know you know those people, uh, yeah. Melissa, uh, Melissa Ade, Melissa Aid. Aid, Melissa yeah. Aid. Uh, so if if it gets selected for that, uh, it'll it'll premiere in in Toronto. So for that iteration, you know, for that for that festival, I created a new iteration. Nice. Um, yeah. Was that the first time that you'd revised it, or had you revised it before? Uh, there were some revisions. Uh, for uh, you know there were some revisions of the scripts to make it uh work uh in um in different cultures mm. uh just but nothing major they were um different cultures for different countries really so i yeah. i gave permission to the people in chennai india to uh to set it in in chennai mm. and we we did research together the director and i based on you know there was uh, one of the characters is from newfoundland and i wanted it i wanted the that sort of us and them um i I wanted the subtext that canadians understand inherently that comes with um a person being from newfoundland Mm -hmm. i wanted to find a parallel within uh within indian society so that was a really interesting uh, conversation. The same thing happened with another play of mine, uh, uh, Transformative Potential of Laundry, that was done at last year's um, Sydney Short and Sweet Festival. Uh, they, there was a number of uh, place names and, and uh, associations that, uh, within the script that they wanted to find local versions of and i'm i'm not precious about it i, I want it to be relatable and uh um uh, i sort of yeah i enjoyed i enjoyed that process with nine types so i uh, i said yeah sure go ahead and make it uh, make it local did you work with them on that or did you just let them change the place names to whatever worked? no i worked with them you know i made sure that they understand why i chose that you know that particular place you know that uh if uh you know if you're if you're choosing hamilton as the the place where a character comes from and that's part of who that character is 
uh, there are, you know, we have associations with, with Hamilton that, uh, uh, are immediately going to spring to mind when, 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 uh, when you introduce yourself as someone from Hamilton. So I wanted there to be, and I'm just pulling that out of the air. The character was, yeah, yeah. but just as an example, and they, I, I, I made sure that together the director and I, we, we found, uh, we found parallels that, that mirrored what it is I was trying to go through, uh, uh, what, what it is I was trying to say about that character's origins. How long have you been working with the Monday night group? I've been there. Uh, almost 10 years. Mm. It's uh it's great. It's a unique, it's a unique program in that, uh, uh, it's it's by invite only. There's a lot of working pros there. No one's there to, um, you know, to spruce up the real. Yeah. Um, no one gets up to talk about the scenes afterward. Uh, there's no, there's no teacher who kind of lords over the the proceedings and uh, passes judgment. The the only the only sort of sense of of how the play or the scene it is that you're doing uh is going is the audience's reaction Mm. so uh, really it's like a gym and you go in there and uh um you know like you were doing as if you were doing a workout if you can lift you know if you're having a day where you can where you can free lift you know 200 pounds uh then you do it and if if you can't do it that day, you know, and it's 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 the same thing for Monday night. If you're if you're on, the audience reacts, and if you're if you're at all introspective and have any self knowledge, you know when it's working. It's also a, a very uh, open place in that uh, people are given permission to work outside their comfort zone, and there's no judgment. So people come in there and they try new stuff and there's a lot of writers that are associated with it. As I, as I mentioned before, there's the writing circle that uh, has grown out of it. So it's a, it's one of these places where if you're an actor, if you're a writer, if you're a producer, if you're a director, there's there's always something for you to do. There's always a project going. Someone is always uh, creating. I always find it's important. I think it's important to surround yourself with creative people. Creativity feeds creativity, and so it's important to make sure that you have those people around you. Yeah, you you need to uh, you need to find a tribe. You need to find find and build community. If you don't have it, I don't know. I think that's why I'll never just be a writer because it can be kind of a lonely pursuit. Yeah. Uh, especially, well, if you're writing for theater, maybe it's not as lonely. But uh, um, it's definitely uh, a far lonelier pursuit than um, than than being an actor, yeah. and I crave that uh, that connection and the collaboration. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, we are all basically at at almost an hour here. Okay, um, and uh, I want to thank you for for talking with me today. Uh, it's been great. Well, my pleasure, Phil. It's uh, it's been a long time. Hopefully, we can meet face to face next time. And-